This is your Kick-Ass Life Podcast, episode number 163. As a leader, are you looking for something bigger for yourself? I'm a huge fan of Seth Godin's work, and I want to tell you about his Alt-MBA workshop. It's an intensive leadership and management workshop designed for change makers. This is for people who are itching to level up and make a bigger impact. Four times a year, the workshop brings together over 100 leaders, people from different industries and areas of expertise. The end result, you're surrounded by other leaders who are moving to the top of their respective fields and helping to support each other to become stronger, cross-functional change agents. It's not about passively learning in this workshop. It's about actively putting newfound concepts into practice until they become habit. The idea is to drink from the fire hose and rewire your brain to make new, better habits and have the platform to practice them. They're now accepting applications for their upcoming session. To find out more, visit altmba.com forward slash your kickass life and tell them I sent you. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host, the girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Ass Kickers, welcome to another episode of the podcast. As always, I am so glad you're here. I'm kind of shaking my head as I think about creating this intro and telling you about what's coming up in this episode. I wanted to do something different, so I brought on my really good friends, Amy Smith of The Joy Junkie. She's been a guest on here several times. Kira Sabin of The League of Adventurous Singles. She's been on here at least once, maybe one other time. These are the two women I am co-hosting the adventure slash event slash conference at the end of this year in October in Southern California called Tanning, Tacos, and Transformation. It's our third year hosting the event, and I wanted to have them on to introduce you to them if you have never met them before. And, okay, the funny part is, is that I wanted to do something different, and we do talk about personal development in this episode. We do, I promise. And we also, I asked them some ridiculous questions, which they had ridiculous answers. There's a lot of laughter There is also a lot of foul language. Let me tell you, I know this podcast is already marked as explicit, but this is probably the most bad words I've ever had in one episode. This one is taking the cake because we have a conversation about bad words and it just, it got a little bit out of hand at one point. At any rate, it is not for children is my point. (laughs) So I'm just excited for you to meet them. I'm excited and nervous for you to hear this conversation. And I will stop talking about it so you can just hear it and get on with the show. So without further ado, here is myself and Amy and Kira. Here we are, ass kickers of the Your Kick-Ass Life podcast audience. This is the first time, I think, or no, I've had one other episode where I've had three people, but this is the first time I've had three very bossy women. (laughs) (laughs) This might be an hour of us just like trying to talk over each other. (laughs) Right. Very possible. (laughs) <laughs> but I'm excited to have you both on, two people that know me very well and two people that have a sense of humor just like ours. And we wanted to do something different for this particular episode. And we are going to, I'm going to ask some questions. My guests, who you already heard about in the intro, are going to ask some questions of me. And then we're going to talk about an upcoming event that we have. So who's ready to get started? Hell Woo-hoo! yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to start with a serious question. And this question is, and this is the last serious question, (laughs) but it's, what is the thing you see women come to you for that they want to quote unquote fix? I know we don't like using the word fix, but I'm going to use it. What is the thing you, you see them come to you for that they want to fix, but underneath it, it's actually something else. So tell us what the thing is that they want to fix and then what you end up uncovering is the actual thing that they need to work on. So who wants to go first? Amy, you want to go first? Or you want me to? I can go. Okay, go ahead, hon. I think that I hear an iteration of, I just want to be happy. You know, I get a lot of people who say, I'm really stuck. I have checked off a lot of the boxes in my life. I have the degree. I have the husband. I have the kids. I have the house. And for some reason, I'm still really unhappy. And there's this kind of sense of loss of like, where do I go? I don't know how to fill this void. 
And I obviously get a ton of people who are in the camp where they really want more confidence. They want to speak up for themselves. They want to know how to establish boundaries, how to say no. And I would say that pretty much no matter where they are at in their life and whatever the surface story is, I think underneath all of that is an issue around worthiness, around self-worth. And I would probably argue that's pretty much the case in almost all of personal development, Mm -hmm. because I really think that when we choose to silence ourselves, when we don't speak up to the mother-in-law or the overbearing spouse or whoever it happens to be, the subconscious message that we're sending to ourselves over and over again with that habitual behavior is that that person's wants, needs, and desires are more important than mine. And that messaging is they matter more than me. I'm not enough as is. What I want and desire as a human isn't good enough. And then we see it manifested in all of the external things of, well, gosh, maybe if I get married or maybe if I buy this house or maybe if I finally start my life coaching business, which we see everywhere now, (laughs) then I'll be happy. But I think really it's it's a relationship to self-worth. That's what I see. I mean, I couldn't agree more. And that you sounded fancy as fuck right there, Amy. I just want to say that. <laughs> Not the first time she's answered that question, I guess. Right. I mean, it was pretty I amazing. Thought you I did know. But you just I mean, I just like that you're sharing it with everybody else, too, on this podcast, because, you know, for me, and this is like, I think you said something really great there, Amy, which was I think worthiness is at the core of everything we do. I work with a little bit different audience than the two of yous. Two of yous. Two of you. Uh, <laughs> what are you talking about? Two of yous? <laughs> uh, I work with single women. And everything we do is at the core of confidence, right? The core of worthiness. And where it really shows up with the ladies who come to me is in their vulnerability or lack of. You know, they have all their shit together, right? They've got a great job. They've got great friends. A lot of them travel around the world. They have their life intact. They want this partner, but they have no idea how to be vulnerable enough to let that person come into their life and want to stay. That's Mm -hmm. a huge thing for my people. And they're like, why am I single? I don't get it. I have all my stuff together, da, 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 da. But they are so scared of that rejection. They're so scared of being hurt by opening themselves up that that lack of vulnerability really keeps them in the space of just loneliness. Because if somebody doesn't know how to play a role in your life, they won't stay. Yeah. I love that, that you teach that. Like, holy shit, did I need that? I need your work 20 years ago. (laughs) (laughs) Even 10 years ago. (laughs) Uh, Thank you. Yeah. I think for me, mine is, I have like a, I I was thinking about this because when I was coming up with what I wanted to ask you guys on this podcast, it suddenly dawned on me like, oh, I should probably answer the questions too, since this is like a threesome and (laughs) this isn't really so much of an interview as a group conversation. But I, I feel like I have a spectrum of people and it really depends on where people are at in their personal development journey. I have people that are sort of brand new to it and they're dipping their toes in. But I think for just the sake of answering this question, the people that I get that are ready to work with me privately, those women have spun their wheels for so long. And similarly to what Amy was saying about like wanting to be happy, just like what is this missing piece? My women have usually climbed the corporate ladder. They have chosen work as their mode of checking out and, you know, gotten promoted and promoted and promoted and made a lot of money and some of them are mothers, some of them are not. And they just get to a point where they're kind of at the end of their rope and they aren't totally sure what's going on. Many of them know what it is, though. They know that it's that vulnerability piece that we're talking about. It's that feeling of like they're not enough. But everybody else in their life would think that they have everything together. So it's really interesting. By the time they're ready to work with me privately, they typically know. But it's interesting when like in this whole world of wellness, Everybody listening, (laughs) you might think it's one thing that you need to work on, but it's really, it's like, I call it like seven layers deep. What's really going on is the relationship you have with yourself. Totally. Absolutely. Nobody likes that answer. Nobody likes the answer that it's fucking your job. You know, Mm -hmm. it's your issue. It's internal. It's your shit to unpack. It's so much easier if we can just tell me 
Kira, how to bat my lashes so that I can make dudes swoon over me. Tell me, Andrea, how do I just magically become happy? Tell me, Amy, how can I just walk into something and have all the words to have a tough conversation? Like everybody wants these external solutions. And I think exactly what you're pointing to, Andrea, you get to a point where you don't care what the solution is anymore. You're so done feeling pain Mm -hmm. that you will look at the deep shit. You're You're ready. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. And I love this conversation. I could talk about the deep stuff all day long, but let's shift gears and have a fun question. I know both of you are going to love this question. And I warned everybody in the beginning about this episode. I would like to know, I don't actually, I I have a suspicion. I know the answer to this for both of you, but what is your favorite curse word? Fuck. Fuck. (laughs) Duh. (laughs) Duh. I mean, I really like when I like statements or sentences where I can fit as many curse words into it. (laughs) Like, like fuck that shit. Like the fact that I can fit two Swear words into a three word statement is amazing to me. Yeah. Dreams do come true. Thank you. (laughs) It's a gift. That's so funny. I really like to incorporate swear words into a conversation where I can also use really fancy big words. Like, (sighs) listen to me. You don't have to be fucking acerbic and grandiloquent about it. Just fucking shoot me straight. You know what I mean? Like, I love to. (laughs) Mix it up. People are are like, wait, what? (laughs) What just happened? It's the best. It's the best. I feel like my favorite curse word, I feel like it's like, oh, it's such a hard choice. I, and it maybe changes depending on the season of my life. And maybe my favorite is shit because I heard it so much growing up. (laughs) (laughs) My mom threw that word around. Oh my gosh. Never did she drop an F-bomb. But yes, it is certain that any given day, shit was flying around and still it cracks me up. But I have to tell you guys a story. I don't think I told either of you this story. So speaking of curse words, I've passed down the same legacy. We don't drop F-bombs in our house. My kids have heard it, but all the other, most of the other curse words, yes. I mean, not to an extreme, but yes, they heard them and they know them. So we were in the car driving to Myrtle Beach. It's like a four hour drive from where we live. And we listened to a lot of different NPR podcasts and we were listening to This American Life. And Kira, I know you love that one too. Amy, I don't know if you listen to it that much, but it was the one where it was like this community and there was like these people that were taking over the school district or something. Anyway, they had warned us in the beginning of the episode that there was some explicit language. And me and Jason were like, well, it's okay. They've heard all the words, so it'll be fine. And it was a great story. And so then, and then they warned us again. And the, they're like, okay, this is the part where if you have small children, you may want to cover their ears. And I was like, don't worry. <laughs> so it was a recording of an argument that had happened. Somebody, there was this argument between these people and someone had a camera, you guys. So this man is arguing with this other man and he called him a fucking cocksucker. And that is like one of the ultimate, right? Like <laughs> one that I gasped out loud and as quickly as I could try to like turn the radio off, there was a then the guy in the recording turned to a woman and called her a fucking cunt. And oh. <laughs> both Jason and I were like <laughs> No. So I turn the radio off and I turn around slowly and look at my children and they both have like these huge eyes. And all I said was, now you have heard the very worst of the bad words. (laughs) There they are. And oh my God, I was slightly horrified. There's something about having your children's virgin ears here. I did not think those were the words that were going to come out. Cocksucker and cunt. No. (laughs) No. I mean, they warned you, right? They warned they you. They did. That's hilarious. I it was going to be like, God damn it, shit. No, no. I mean, oh and Andrea, I think you'll be, I don't know if you guys know this about me. I think Andrea, swear words were not flying around my house. I think, Amy, probably the same for your house. But uh-huh. I was so a non-swearer growing up that there was a time, ready for this story, after swing choir, because that's happening, that, that, we were standing outside in this, these like, there was like a circle of girls around me who were a little bit of the tougher girls. And they were like, Kira, say shit. And I'm like, no, you can't make me. <laughs> oh my God. And they're like, come on, do it. Say shit. I'm like, no, I don't use those words. I mean, 
What? <laughs> that's, Those that's girls that smoke cigarettes. That from right. Andrea and I surrounding you now, forcing right. you to talk about human excrement. Right. <laughs> The bullying has lasted in my life the whole time, I guess. Like, <laughs> first about swear words, now about farts. We and only, and we mean, only, for my audience's sake, we only talk about that to make you uncomfortable. But you've gotten a lot better. Like, at first, you were like, <laughs> I know. We're like, do you poop? <laughs> Living with a boy oh. really, you know, changes that I'm shit. I'm so, so glad. Yeah. I'm so glad you've reached that level of your relationship. <laughs> <laughs> I still, you know, speaking of poop, like I still, I know you feel differently about this, Amy. I don't know how you and Danny do this, Kira, but pooping is still one of those things. Like I'm like, shut the door. Like I will not, like I'll pee with the door open. No problem. But pooping it's like, and, and plus like, I don't want to see my husband poop. It's like, to me, <laughs> so maybe it's like a vulnerability thing. I just, it's a no for me. Well, I don't prefer it. <laughs> I I, it's not like up there on it's not foreplay we don't no we don't i mean we do close the door we just don't close it all the way like so <laughs> that's your almost signal. always i come downstairs right at the time when mr smith is pooping in the downstairs bathroom and he always has it slightly ajar and so i'm always like good morning hey pooper and he's like i'm pooping and we just like this thing you know, but I'm not like busting in there. But we have on a number of occasions because we have this very strict ritualistic way of saying goodbye to each other. So you do not leave our household without saying goodbye. So there's been a few times when one of us has been taking a shit and the other one's like, I've got to say goodbye. And so it's like, <gasps> hold your breath, go in real quick, give a kiss, bye. And you like, do run not. Out. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard pass for me. <laughs> so, yeah. You much. guys, I feel like the student has surpassed the teachers right here. <laughs> Do you poop with the door open in your relationship, Kira? I mean, like I said, it's not like a preference or ideal, but it's pretty much like whatever is is at this point. You know what I mean? Like whatever happens, happens. Oh like gosh. if I need to talk to him and he's pooping, like I talk to him. You I know don't I'm like gonna go get emails about this, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fucking free podcast. Calm down. <laughs> okay. Well, now I feel like I really know both of you about that. I mean, that was something that I really didn't know. I've gotten to know you better, and so has everybody else. Okay. Next question. Now, this is actually okay. a little bit more of a serious one. This is the last serious one, and I want to know what has been the hardest time you've ever had to walk your talk in terms of the work you do? Maybe not the hardest time, but a hard time in your life where you know what you needed to do and it was really difficult to do the right thing. Oh, wow. Shit. I think I know. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Amy. <laughs> As I give an air of being quite somber and sad. No, I, you know, I think if anybody's ever, if they're familiar at all with my work, what I do, I talk a lot about boundaries, standing up for yourself, giving voice to things. And for sure, the most challenging has been my relationship with my mom. And I've talked about that considerably. But I will say that second to that, it's probably with you, Andrea. Mm -hmm. Like that's because I think what happens is when, this is what I speculate, is that when you're so invested and you love somebody so much, the idea of saying something that could be vulnerable, like what you were saying, Kara, and where you could be rejected and where somebody might not forgive you or might not understand is really fucking scary. And I know that we've talked a lot about sort of the blessings, I mean, even between the three of us of doing business with life coaches, you know, where we can actually speak up about things and be a bit more vulnerable than the average bear. But it's not that it's radically easier than it used to be. It's just that you choose to operate from courage instead of fear. But I think that in the latter years, because I've dealt with so much stuff with my mom many, many years ago, I think now that's the hardest thing for me still. But I will say that because I remember even a few years ago, Andrea, there was something you had done on your website that I felt like was from my website. And I was 
agonizing over telling you about it. And I was a mess and I was fumbling over all my words. And you were like, are you serious? You're that worked up about this. <laughs> but it was a big deal for me, you know, and you don't want to lose that friendship. And now I've noticed the older I've gotten, and especially because I preach this at least once a week to thousands of people, I physically can't tolerate it anymore. I'm uncomfortable if I know something needs to be addressed. Physically, I can't just sweep it under the rug. It just, it hurts too much. And I know, Andrea, you've even said, if there's a problem, Amy will say it, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is true. But it doesn't mean that it's with, it doesn't have an element of fear still. It's just that I choose to push through it. I choose courage instead. And I think that's important for people to hear that it's not that all of this stuff that we teach magically becomes incredibly easy. It's that you choose a different perspective about it over and over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. For me, and you, I mean, yeah, for me, and I think the exciting thing is that you guys were there for this. But since I talk about dating and relationships, and I was single for the first, like the majority of the beginning of my coaching. And so when I started dating Danny, I may definitely recovering shit show dater like hands down (laughs) and you guys remember right like I remember when we really Danny and I really got into this I don't remember it was like one of you or both of you but you're like wow okay we weren't sure we were (laughs) not sure if you Mm -hmm. were gonna make it through this yeah because getting vulnerable and asking for what I need and just showing up and not running is very hard for me It's very, very hard for me. And I had to absolutely, you know, walk my talk through every step of that first three to six months, especially because that's where I get very nervous and I usually leave. If I Mm -hmm. sniff rejection, if I sniff getting hurt, you know, I'm out the door and I just I refused. I was like, this is a good man. And I am going to keep seeing this through until it doesn't make sense to see it through anymore. Mm. You know, and we're almost three years. We live together. We moved to a foreign country together and back. And I mean, we are, I never even imagined I could have anything this solid and beautiful. It's amazing. Oh. But you guys remember, you're it's, like, oh my God. It was, it was, that was a rough spot in the beginning, I remember. Calm. There was some touch and go. Yeah. yeah. There, oh yeah, there was. Absolutely. We were like, wait a minute. Is Kara a stage five clinger? I think Kara might be a stage five clinger. <laughs> yeah, it I passed, mean, this is though. Uh, yeah, it did. It did. It did. But that's, you know, it's it's great to be able to tell the stories, you know, to the ladies in my classes and on the calls because I got through it, right? I chose courage, just like you said, Amy. I was like, I'm going to talk to my friends. I'm going to make the best decisions out of love, not fear, and just keep checking this out. But it was hard. It was very hard for me. Yeah. Wow. I like that Amy said that and both of you have essentially said it, that it's not that it's easier now. (laughs) It's just that we choose. (laughs) And I think it becomes more uncomfortable when you know this work in your bones and you don't have to do this for a living. You know, you could just attend seminars and read the books and listen to the podcast and know it and know it and know it. And then you're faced with these situations. For me, when I came up with this question, I was like, well, for me, it's like every day. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. Every day. But the ones that stick out to me the most, you know, going in backwards chronological order, the death of my father and not drinking through it or not numbing out with like the big stuff. And then also for me, it's been about trust. It's been about trusting my female friendships and trusting my romantic relationship that I have now because I had only well, I chose to see only the evidence that people are not to be trusted. Nobody. I mean, not even my parents. Like I'm I'm like, all of you are dangerous. And so I'm going to stay over here. And, you know, Brene Brown talks about the myths of vulnerability. And one of them is that you can opt out. And that was me. I was like, no, that's for other people. So I'm going to be a life coach and see what happens. (laughs) (laughs) How'd that work out for you? I'm going to help other people trust. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, every day for me. It's hard. Yeah. No, I, I, as soon as you asked that question, I was like, one thing? Are we kidding? You know, it's just, <laughs> and I mean, you know, and I guess the great thing about this work is 
when we start doing it, like we said, it's it's not that it changes. We just choose differently or have like tools or strategies. You know, the stuff in my brain, I don't go down the rabbit hole for days anymore. Yeah. It's for minutes. Right. And I bring myself back up. You know, it's just it's the work is so important and it doesn't stop it. But I just know how to deal with it better. Yeah, that's right. Mm hmm. I like to say it's a management system. That's what it is. You just manage everything differently. And I do think it gets easier in the sense that you become more familiar with a new way, you know, Mm -hmm. and I just had an experience. Oh, God. And I've been doing this for fuck. We've all been doing this for a decade. I had an experience with my mom where it was truly second nature, what came out. And it was completely a guilt inflicted conversation that she was really pouring on all this guilt. And it was related to religion. And I didn't skip a beat. And I have to say that that was the first time that it felt like it was organic. Most of the time, I have to gear up and I have to use the tools and the exact same things that I teach. And I know you guys are the same. But I do think one thing that does really change is your resilience. And this is what you were talking about, Kara, is you might still get down or discouraged about something, but it doesn't take you fucking out for two Mm -hmm. months. It might be just a week or a day instead of an entire season of your life. Right. It's more management instead of damage control. Yes. We should yeah. like write that down somewhere. That's a tweet waiting to happen. <laughs> tweet them all. Quote me. <laughs> <laughs> good. I'm glad I asked that question. That was good conversation. All right, moving on. And I want to know, yeah. like, I, I really want to know selfishly. <laughs> this is going to be so great. Okay. What is the most dangerous thing you've ever done? Oh, shit. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, my Cur- God. Cursed on a podcast? <laughs> This is the worst because I'm the most non adventurous, non risk taker, follows the rules type of person. I'm like, what have I done that's actually legit dangerous? I, okay, I'll tell you, it's so pathetic that everybody out there is going to be like, that's embarrassing. They shouldn't, they should have cut that. They should have cut that Why do you think I asked this question? So, Yeah, I'm just such a rule follower. So I had quite a bit to drink. And this was probably only maybe two. Is this the end of your story? (laughs) This was only like last night. (laughs) No, this was probably like two years ago. And we decided, we had a couple of friends over and uh, Mr. Smith, we decided. And there, by the way, she's like a fucking fighter pilot in the military. So already world's more badass than me. And so I'm going like, okay, don't be such a pussy. They decide it was the night of one of the eclipses or something fancy, blood moon, some shit like that. I don't care. So we decide that we're going to climb on top of our condo complexes. We're going to go up the emergency little thing on the side. I guess it's to fix the air conditionings that are on top of all of the units. We had to go specifically get a key so that we could do it. And our condos are five levels. So they're very high up and I'm tipsy and I'm terrified of heights. So here I am, all these libations and I'm climbing up like fucking Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible thinking that I can scale this building and I had to really focus like on each little hand like okay just one one hand in front of the other one hand in front of the and then the next day I was totally having remorse about it because I felt guilty that I was negligent towards my safety (laughs) oh my god (laughs) so I would walk my dogs and I would walk by those ladders that are on the side of the complex and I would just like hang my head and so disappointed in your behavior (laughs) so dangerous what were you thinking and totally had to tell mr smith like don't ever let me do that again that was really negligent and he was like you are a pussy (laughs) amy you could never live in my head you could just never live there it wouldn't exist that was awesome well i mean i feel like kira plus alcohol equals every ridiculous situation that ever could exist throughout my, I don't know, 20 some years as as an adult, you know, everything from, 
I lived in South Korea at a military base as a 21 year old girl. And the, yeah, like the stories I could tell about that are a little nuts. You know, I worked on cruise ships for five years and, you know, ended up in all of these interesting places and interesting situations, let alone I've bungee jumped before and, and things like that also, you know, which is kind of like the more basic risk taking things. But I would say that, you know, I have put myself in weird situations, but had an amazing time. So, oh my yeah, God. I know, Amy, you're like, I don't understand. I don't. I don't. What is this bungee you speak of? Oh my gosh. I'm the worst. Andrea, go. I have so many. Like I, I let me <laughs> just let me just pick one from the plethora. I mean, they're everything ranging from really risky, unhealthy behavior, like having sex without a condom <laughs> with some guy I just met who was hot. And <laughs> to be okay, this one stands out for me. There's there's so many, but I was thinking before <laughs> we started recording. And this, I was 16, 17 and drinking, which the combination of teenagers and drinking, not good. We, <laughs> and I'm sure that this was the case for many teenagers. I grew up in San Diego and there was a lot of growth happening as far as like neighborhoods and stuff. So they would have these, we'd have these field parties. Did anybody else have field parties? And especially when they had like cleared an area to start building a neighborhood and it was like, you know, packed dirt and it was this open area, we would go out there and, and have parties. So dumb. But anyway, there was this guy, his name was Scott, and he had this like souped up, Chevy Bronco, and we all thought it was a good idea for him to take us like boonie wampin out there. That's what we called it. <laughs> and so, like, probably 10 of us pile into this car, and I'm sitting on like the center console in the car. He's drunk. We are like in this field. Oh my God. I was like, it was like a jumping bean, like in the car. I was like, all just, oh my God. I remember hitting this, the roof of the car, my back, and like, <laughs> And then I, I, rem I remember thinking to myself, this is probably a bad idea. <laughs> oh, I lived through it. I mean, yeah, I've gotten into a taxi cab in Tijuana, Mexico to go get drugs. I have, God, so many bad, bad ideas. And then probably the majority of them, there has been a part of me that has known it was a bad idea, but I did it anyway. I have enough, probably enough stories. I mean, it's like part of the reason that I quit drinking because I made terrible choices while drinking. And uh, yeah. Oh, God. You know, it's so funny, Andrea, that you said that because it's kind of like it depends on what you think dangerous is, right? Like I would never have sex with random guys without a condom. Like it would not even cross my mind as a possibility. But yeah. I've got bu bungee jumping. You know what I mean? It's you know kind what of that was? Like, I mean, this is a, probably a different conversation for a different time. That was such a disregard for myself. And just, I mean, that was a dark time of mine and just not really caring about what happened and also wanting to please the guy, not wanting to, I mean, I was a love addict for fuck's sake. I mean, that's what, <laughs> that's what many of us do. You know, we don't, it's not, it's about so much more and it's so emotionally layered that part of my story is that I didn't want to upset anyone. I knew consciously that it was a bad choice and that I needed to ask him to wear a condom, but I didn't want to. Like, I felt like it was just this uncomfortable conversation. I didn't know how to have those uncomfortable conversations. I didn't want him to say no. What if he rejected me? You know? So yeah, that's why that happened. Got it. <laughs> Amy's over there going, I don't understand. Well, I just, I've never been... I've never been that way, you know, like Andrea always jokes that I came out of the womb evolved, mm -hmm. she <laughs> but I don't know. I just, I was a kid in high school that never wanted to be made fun of for drinking. So I always had a Pepsi because I would just, wasn't going to be that girl that everybody laughed at, you know, mm -hmm. but who fucking thinks that when you're 16, you know, and I was studying Shakespeare during the summer and doing shit like that. It's just, it's embarrassing, too, to think of that, that I'm like, live a little, <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's funny. And, like, I'm embarrassed of funny. my own stories. I, I think I've come a long way with it, and I've actually had to do work around that because I, when I started my own journey and started to change my ways, I felt so much shame for all of those stories and, like, the choices that I had made. And I was in – that whole time, I was in so much pain. And that was a lot of the reason for those choices, just, like, total – disregard for my own well-being. I just didn't care. Part of it was, you know, because I'm a teenager and I just wasn't making good choices and just being irresponsible. But a lot of it I had to forgive myself for and really just have some self-compassion. I did the best I could. I didn't have any tools, yeah. none whatsoever. 
Yeah. I mean, how would you, you know, Mm -hmm. that's one of the things that I talk about a lot. And I'm sure you guys do too, is that like, where the fuck are you supposed to learn this stuff? Right. I know. Our conference. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Let's, Let's talk about it real quick. And then I know you guys have a couple of questions for me. And I have one more question for you, another funny one. So let's talk about that. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on because we are in open registration again for the Tanning Tacos and Transformation Conference this October in Huntington Beach, California. Many of you probably already know about it. Some of you might not. And there's links in the show notes so you can read the entire info page. But let's tell everybody and go over what we're going to talk about on this conference. What will people walk away with when they do come? And like, what are the, some of the awesome things that happen? I'll just kick it off. On the first day, we're going to talk about all things inner critic, right? We're each going to give a workshop, a little mini workshop on learning how to have more compassionate self-talk, right? Isn't that what we're doing? <laughs> <laughs> you sounded really convincing there. Seriously. Yes, that's exactly what we're doing. Right. Well, we're talking about how to, you know, control our thoughts more, control our brain, because when you have control of your brain, you have control of, you know, a lot how more than every, everything else we mm-hmm. think we can. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And that particular day, I do a whole segment on fear and how fear is kind of the emotional equivalent of our self-talk and how they work in tandem. And one of the things that I love so much about teaching with you guys, which by the way, this is our third iteration of Mm -hmm. tanning tacos and transformation. And, And it's something that we hear consistently from our attendees is that it's so cool to get three different perspectives on one particular topic, because you'll end up taking away little nuggets from each person. And you might come because you are really, you know, you follow Andrea's work, but then you might learn a shit ton about Kira's specific perspective on inner critic and how to kind of work with that. But I think one of the things with all three of us is that we all highly value the science behind it. Mm -hmm. And so we're teaching you shit that actually works And we've seen it work over and over again, both in our own lives, but also with our students and clients. And you have tangible, tactile exercises so that when you get back home and you are triggered by that amazing parent who always makes you feel like shit because you don't think you're enough, or when you start going into that spiral, when you look in the mirror and start picking yourself apart, you'll have tools to combat that in the moment, because we can all go on an amazing weekend and feel great, Mm -hmm. but you need to go back. Right. You need to be able to go back in your real world and know what to say to yourself instead. Mm -hmm. And that is so powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. I can't remember if it's on the second or third day, but that's one of probably my favorite workshops of yours, Amy, is when you talk about boundary setting and that's what people really like they like the concept of boundaries but they're like okay I think I can I think I can do it but what do I actually say and I love that you give a process for that for people to really actually take back to their life and use and then also we will have time for Q&A so if you feel like your situation is unique which everybody does you'll have the time to ask us and say like here's what's going on in my life what do you think I should say how do you think I should do it approach it etc so we will have time for that also we this is going to be more intimate than we had originally planned and we're excited for that I know some people are like oh I don't know if I want to be like this huge group of people I'd rather be able to you know spend some time with Amy, Andrea, Kira, like we're one person, but but you'll get to do that. It's held at the beautiful Shore Break Hotel, literally on the beach. And they have free s'mores. I mean, just for that. S'mores. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, and you have to hear Kira's talk about how we learn to love. Yes. And about our love languages and how that infuses the way in which we engage in relationships. And so I have to tell you a funny story. I've heard this speech multiple times, right? But I still fucking love listening to Kira talk about it. And so we were in Mexico last year where the frizz. Please don't tell me you're going to tell the frizz you story. (laughs) It's wildly witty. And so Andrea is coming up with this amazing hybrid word of issue and frizz, calling it I have frizz juice and she comes to this realization right during 
Kira's brilliant speech about how you learn to love. And when I gone so to the bathroom I, and thought of it and then came back from the bathroom and yeah, was and so pleased with myself. Like, tugging at me like oh my god look i've got free shoes i've got free shoes and i'm going okay wait first of all i really respect that that's good and, but second of all i'm trying to listen to kira god damn it so kira She's you're that brilliant. riveting i love listening to that i almost teared up a little bit right there amy oh thank you no, because, you know, it's a good reminder. No, I love talking about that because I think it's something we don't think about, which is we all have learned to love different ways. And the more and more that we can know, A, how we learn to love and how we like to be loved, and B, really love and respect the people in our lives and the way they love to be loved, life gets a lot easier. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Absolutely. A ton easier. You can read more about it at triple, the word triple, the letter T conference, triple T conference.com. It's in the show notes and we are closing up registration shortly, someday in the future that I don't have in front of me. (laughs) (laughs) But it's urgent, people. Urgent. (laughs) No, it's definitely the payment plan is going to end on August 20th. So if you want, we've kept it super affordable, but if you do still want to break up the payments, Definitely get on board before August 20th. We have also added some extra stuff that you can can read about it all on the page. I think one of also the favorite things, my favorite things about this is that we spend some time telling you exactly how to bring it back into your life. So we don't just like, again, like Amy was saying, like, get you all pumped up. And then we're like, have fun. We're not going to help you. (laughs) See ya. We call it reentry, going back into your real life. And that's where people tend to struggle. So we set you up to support you on that. And You know, what we added this year that I also love is the fact that every day we do like a QA, and a right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the past, we kind of gave our speeches and last year we kind of did really short breakouts. But this year, every single day, people are then going to get to ask us questions about our talks, like how to apply it to their own personal situations, you know, and I just think that that is super valuable to be able to like bring your own story and get answers around it. And other people's questions always help the entire group. And so that's why we decided to incorporate that. We've listened to feedback from years past and brought it into make this really awesome for everybody. And we would absolutely love to be able to squeeze you in person. And I know so many of you say, like, I listen to your podcast. I feel like I know you. And it's just awesome to get to see people face to face and hear their stories and sometimes see them cry or share celebrations with us. And we would love to have you. Absolutely. And it's, you know what? I mean, I think that especially for the price that we've created because we wanted people to be able to afford it if they wanted to. This is life changing. It is straight up life changing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the more and more that I do triple T or just conferences, getting in real life. Yeah. So not just online and not just, you know, reading articles or books, but getting in real life and really doing the work with a group of other like minded women who are doing the same thing is so powerful. So powerful. For sure. For really. sure. Anything else you uh, you want to add, Amy? Or should we move on I, to the questions that you have for me? Sure. The we question. Can move on. One question. <laughs> right. All right. Amy, you want to go first? I guess. I don't. I feel like I know everything about you. But I think there might be. I feel like there's a really good story in something about a white bongo jean jacket oh my god is, with the jungle juice that, yes that whole night and was a disaster about, or you were barefoot in the bushes somewhere but i think <laughs> that's that's gonna be the title of my memoir barefoot in the bushes drinking jungle juice in a white bongo jacket <laughs> i love it <laughs> oh that doesn't god. scream 90s i don't know what does that's okay exactly i'll tell the story so i okay. had borrowed this white it was like a sleeveless <clears throat> denim jacket. It was I was wearing it like as a shirt. Does people remember those? Yeah. Okay. And it was oh, my man. friend Tisha's. And we go to this party in Pacific Beach in San Diego. And somewhere along the way I lost my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> we were probably 19, 19-ish. It was the summer probably I think after we graduated high school. 
18 or 19, and I lost my shoes. I have my white bongo jean jacket slash shirt on, and there's this cooler at this party that's full of juice. It's so gross. So gross. And, like, people get their red Solo cups and just, like, get a scoop of it and drink it. So I'm trying to do that, and then I spilled the red jungle juice on this white bongo shirt that is not mine. So I go in the bathroom, and I'm trying to clean it with toilet paper. <laughs> Because that works. So I'm cleaning this thing. And then Tisha comes in. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I was probably crying. I don't remember. But I'm like, I'm so sorry. I got stained. So I have like red jungle juice on it with toilet paper stuck on there. And then, so then we end up back at, at this dude's house, and it was I think it was his parents' house. And there's this gro- like this row of orange trees, and which will come into play in a minute. So we're at this guy's house, his parents' house. I, I'm assuming his parents were not home because I end up. Well, first I was in the driveway. And I was talking to this boy that I liked. His name was Dustin. You guys, I have this, like, weird... This is how I know I'm, like, on the Asperger spectrum, like my son. Because I have this, like, vivid memory for details, even when I've been drinking. So I'm standing there talking to Dustin. And I went to, like, casually lean over to lean against the garage door. But it was, like, three feet away from me. So I, like, stumbled sideways and went head first into this door and it was so loud against the garage door and I remember his face he was like oh my god are you okay I can't believe he didn't knock me out and I'm like oh my god totally fine so then I end up in this guy's house his parents house and I'm throwing up and my friend Rebecca was holding my hair back and then the guys lean into the bathroom and they're all totally making fun of me I'm like horrified at this point so then we're leaving and then uh, we pile into Tisha's convertible white VW bug. <laughs> this is, by the way, not when like the new cute bug. This was like right, the old right. school bug. And <laughs> then we notice our friend Christine, who's like on all fours in the front yard throwing up. We're like, get in the fucking car. We're leaving. Because Tisha oh. and her boyfriend had been fighting. So then she's in reverse, like trying to back down this long ass driveway where the row of orange trees are and she's like scraping against the trees and then we hear this noise like this pelting and i'm like what we're like what's going on and they were the guys were throwing oranges at Tisha's car <laughs> so then the next day there was like there was pulp all over the side of her car <laughs> that was my life like that was just that was you know just a weekend in san diego hanging out with my friends yeah but that she was so mad at me about the stain on that bongo jacket (laughs) okay does anybody else feel like a that was virtually the plot to can't buy me love (laughs) and b right like the beginning there and then like what i know patrick dempsey i think her name is amanda peterson oh my well Virtually, you're going to want to watch the beginning because it's your life, Andrea. Oh, my God. I can't wait. And then, and then I felt like the second part was a little part Goonies where, like, Chunk is like, bleh. bleh. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Yes. I was so <laughs> embarrassed. And I, I think people. this might have been at a different party, but one of my friends peed in the bathtub because I was taking up the toilet. <laughs> The places I have peed. I mean, I'm from Wisconsin, so you guys grew up in, you know, California, which I always feel like it has some more dignity. Like, growing up in small town Wisconsin, I have peed <laughs> everywhere. Like, any kind of places that you can pee, I have peed. I probably have to. It's kind of embarrassing. But, yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was the white uh, jean jacket story. Oh, my God. That was funny. Can't buy me love, people. Right there. I'll watch it. Oh, that's hilarious. Kara, do you have oh. a question for me that my audience probably doesn't know about me and might not uh, care I- about? <laughs> I wanted to ask, and this is for both of you guys, what was the best 90s fashion that you guys embraced? Because I've seen, you know, like throwback pictures of you guys and they're fantastic. So what was the best like 90 trends that you both really embraced? Oh, oh my God. Remember those like platform shoes were huge. Mine, I know Amy's is probably going to be accessories, <laughs> but no, mine was definitely bodysuits. Like I had so many, I had the lure ones, I had 
just plain colored ones, obviously like in the burgundy, the forest green, the dark purple. I had floral ones. I had even ones that had like wire on the front to like make a cleavage look really good. And <laughs> they hurt my vagina though. Like anybody, like what, what, what? It was like a thong up your front butt. Like what was going on with some of those? I don't know. Oh <laughs> that is so funny. I was always that chapped is- down there. <laughs> I know. They'll like choke a pussy out. <laughs> oh my God. Talking about Amy, what about Amy? What about you? Well, I was definitely going to say bodysuits. That was a big thing. But the whole, like, you're right. Like the whole g-string situation was really something to contend with. But I also, I kind of slayed in the baby doll dress department. Yeah. Oh, I mean, thigh highs too. Dress and leggings. Yes, I had thigh highs. Yes, oh I God. definitely slayed in the baby doll dress department and. I rocked a choker or two. I, yeah, I, I've I been embracing it. that lately, even. I just went shopping with some friends over the weekend, and I was so discouraged because literally there was nothing I would wear. I was like, this is like fucking high school all over again. And then that makes me sound like my mom. Yeah. And then that makes me feel old. And then I feel like, wait, I'm pretty fashion forward. But then I look at these shorts that people are wearing and i'm like you are choking your fucking pussy out you are choking it out <laughs> like pull it out like they're they're wearing she like baby doll shorts where the shorts are like up underneath the boobs i'm like i can't it's so fucking ugly it's so ugly so anyway oh my gosh get worked up about it did you have the baby doll dresses with the baby doll tees underneath oh totally <laughs> <laughs> totally and the mac lipstick like the dark matte <laughs> Burgundy. I couldn't go. Oh, like absolutely. So it was. I mean, we're all. we're starting to see that all like come back around, right? Yeah. Kylie, that was not yours to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> God, gray, gray lipstick. I had that. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, the best. I remember. This is what I remember about the '90s. I mean, and I guess you feel that way you're, when you're in it. But I remember going, God, the '90s is such a classy like classy decade that I really feel like there's not going to be anything to come back and look at and make fun of. Did you think that? I did not think that. I really did. I really, Cause I was like, you know, there was all that like Laura Ashley stuff, right. That was really like 1800s Victoria. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is such true. right. And I was just like, this is such a classy decade. Yeah. Ew. I did not think that <laughs> I, I remember, I remember where I was standing the very first time I heard smells like teen spirit by Nirvana. And I really feel like, when Nirvana came out, I was, was I, God, was I still in high school? I can't remember. I think, I, yeah, I was. Yeah. And we were, I think, at a time as a generation, like we were ready for something else in, in terms of music. And I think that that was such a big deal. But, you know, that whole grunge phase, like I, we, my favorite outfit <laughs> was a bodysuit with jeans I had like these kind of high waisted ones that were kind of baggy, but then they were more tapered at the bottom with either my Doc Martens or if I was feeling fancy, it was flats with no socks. And then I would like tie a flannel around my waist. You know, that was like my way of being like, ooh, kind of, you know, grunge girl, but I wasn't. Into the grunge scene. I wasn't. (laughs) My God. I was going to say as far as 90s fashion, I just remember, and for me, it was like the perfect time to go to college because I look at what girls wear in college now and I'm like, oh my God, so much work because flannels (laughs) were huge when I was in college, Mm -hmm. right? So we all just wore jeans, t-shirts, and then we all would fight over. My friend had a extra, extra large men's (laughs) flannel, right? fight over right because we love like how like big it hung on us and stuff like that we would like literally like all want to borrow it all the time though you know everybody was like super small but it was like oh my god can i wear the abercrombie and fitch flannel Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah it was a big deal big deal did you guys have hyper color shirts (laughs) uh i did not i was too old for that (laughs) am i too young oh my god (laughs) yeah you just ate yours right there oh I remember remember them, but yeah, I was that Kara and I are older than Amy. So yeah, I got those at the swap meet. So they were like the knockoff version. (laughs) Of course. All right. Well, I think that we have really overstayed our welcome with my listeners. (laughs) I'm going to get the emails. Please don't ever do that again. 
<laughs> and or you're no, going to be like, that great. was the best hour of my life. <laughs> One of the two. No. Please tell more Jean Jacket stories. No, I just, I want to do something different and I wanted to have you both on so I could not be the only one who was talking about the Triple T conference and everyone please go check it out and if you are kind of like oh I don't know we are offering quick chats with us if you want to talk to one of us you know like a quick 15 minute call to see if it's for you just to do a gut check if you have any questions if you want to make sure that it's for you we want to make sure it's a solid decision for you and we would love to see you in Orange County in October so triple T conference.com the link is in the show notes anything Kieran Amy, that you need to say to feel complete. No. Just join yeah. us. I think it's going to be incredible. Me too. Can't yeah. Wait. And Kara's way better in person. Kara is way better way in better. person. That's an inside joke. We'll tell you about later. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You'll hear all the inside jokes. <laughs> all right, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. As always, I'm so grateful that you come and listen every week. And until next time, I will see you out in cyberspace. Bye-bye. Hey, Ask Kickers, you know what would help me out so much if you left a rating and review for this podcast. Your Kick-Ass Life podcast will always be free to you and to help me get more awesome guests and to spread the word, it helps tremendously if you leave a rating and a review. Now, they don't particularly make this super easy to do, so I'll help you out a little. If you're in iTunes and you're on your phone, when you are in the podcast app, you need to search for Your Kick-Ass Life podcast. I know, even if you're subscribed, this is how you do it. So when you search for it and you see it come up, click on the cover art, then towards the top where it says reviews, click that, scroll down a tiny little bit, and then click write a review. Stitcher is a bit easier if you're on Android. The easiest way I found to do this is to type into Google stitcher.com, your kick-ass life, and voila, my podcast should pop up as the first link. Scroll down and click write a review. That's it. Thank you so very much. You have no idea how much it helps me when you do that. All right. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.